a dynamic Christ-centered community of believers with sound biblical teachings and prayer committed to demonstrating the love of God and the transforming power of the gospel while reaching out to the nations. You are about to listen to a message produced by Echo Plata Church. Be blessed as you listen. We have two powerful men of God. In law, we call both women and men, men. So two powerful men of God this morning, the professors who will take us through the topic, domestic abuse. That is domestic violence. Please, as we go through the topic this morning, if you have questions, scream it out them, answer them down to the, we'll give we'll pass to the speakers. As we speak this morning, then we'll answer your questions by His grace. God bless you. So we invite to the podium this morning, Professor Etani B. Alemika. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Good morning, church. Um, sometimes I don't know how I get into this problem of coming here. I say I fear this place. Uh, and I've told you how I was brought up to fear the Bible falling down from my hand uh, when I'm carrying it along with my dad. And also the pulpit, I always had the nurse ark as representing this. And so each time I come here, it's as if I'm holding, uh, you know, close to Noah's ark, but God will help us. We are discussing, as young people will say, a trending, okay, a trending topic in our society today. And it's a topic that is very delicate. The challenge we have as Christians is we know a lot, but we experience very little. You don't know what it means to be sick until you are sick. And so we are very judgmental. And I think the lesson we are taught is when Jesus Christ told, you know, told the, the people who accused the woman of adultery, and he said, whoever is not guilty among you to throw the first stone. For me, that's a lesson. Each time I'm about to judge, I said, I don't know where the person is coming from. I don't know what that person has experienced. We're dealing with domestic violence. It's a very difficult topic, and it's a very wide topic. I think in the wisdom of the elders, they have decided to put together maybe two groups of, do you call them experts? People who are a living dealing with some of this matter. I'm a criminologist, so I spend uh, and a living trying to understand some behaviors that society regarded as inappropriate, and also some law that relates to those behaviors. The second speaker is a doctor. The second speaker is a doctor, and uh, we do know that domestic violence has a social, economic, psychological, and medical dimensions. All these four components are present when you are discussing domestic violence. Of course, we do know that all four of them also have roots in the spiritual life of people. So we do hope that God will help us to understand, even if you don't experience it, you never suffered it, that you understand it so that you can help those who are suffering and those who have experienced it. May God help us. We are going to start by looking at some uh, description and there are so many terms that are used that are very similar. We will start by looking at a number of them. The first uh, one is family abuse. Very often what we hear is domestic violence, but there is also the notion of abuse. So we talk about family abuse, and when we talk about family abuse, we are talking about maltreatment of family members. Maltreatment of family members. There is also a domestic abuse. What we try to distinguish between family abuse and uh, domestic and violence. You also have domestic abuse. Family and domestic family abuse and domestic abuse. They are close to each other, but they are different. One is maltreatment of family members. The other one is maltreatment of person within the same household. Household is not equivalent to family. There are people in your household who are not members of your family. Then, of course, what is also regarded as intimate partner abuse. 
intimate partner abuse, and that include maltreatment of spouse, fiance, fiance, and dating partners. Then we have spousal abuse, which are called straightforward maltreatment of spouse. We also have family violence, which is violence against members of the family, and of course we have. Uh, we also have domestic violence, which is against people in the same household. The same thing, intimate partner, is a violence against those who are intimate, spouses, fiancé, and dating partners. What is a household? Of course, family we know are people who are related by blood. When we talk about a family, we are talking about who are related by blood. But when we talk about household, we are talking about people who live together in the same, under the same roof, and demographers will even add another term, and eat from the same pot. So it's either they live under the same roof, or they eat in the same uh, pot. Young men, I know many of you don't live in the same house with your parents, but you go there to eat every evening. That's your household, <laughs> because your stomach is the defining factor. So when we're talking about domestic violence, the reason for you know, these definitions is to enable us to know how wide the topic we are dealing with. So we're talking about family relations by blood. We're talking about household. We're thinking of the, the spouses, the children, the, you know, the stewards, whether you call them housemates or you call them house helps, and then, of course, relatives who live within the house. So the household is broader than the family. And when talking about domestic violence, we're actually talking about household violence. When we refer to domestic, we are talking about household violence. Violence among people who live within the same house and eat from the same pot, according to demo demographers. Why is this important? I have only one family member in Jos. Don't ask me where my wife is. It's a life and son. And it's not because, not run away because of domestic violence. We have our own crisis, but not uh, between us. So I have only one. In my household, that is larger than that. I have people who are in the house who are not related to me. So we're dealing also with how you treat each other as spouses, how you treat your children, how the children treat. Because again, we forget when we're talking about domestic violence, what we call elder abuse. Many people maltreat their parents, especially when they are old or in their world, too old and have become a burden. So when talking about this, we tend to forget those dimensions. So it's a very wide subject, and we've been given four hours. I've warned again that when you ask professors to speak, why they are called professors, not lecturers, because they've learned how to ramble for two hours without problem. OK. OK. So we have four. Um, Four hours to deal with the matter which will have taken us a year. Okay, I'm hearing people protesting. <laughs> that, that, that have exceeded the, norm, at the time we normally spend in this congregation. That's why it is good to have values, to have norms, and to have tradition. Because it tells you what to expect and the behavior that is acceptable. So we're going to spend 15 minutes, 15 minutes uh, 30 minutes, 15 minutes each, and you have 10 minutes to ask questions. I've, no, I try to note that the two terms are used sometimes interchangeably, but abuse is wider. So what is violence? Violence has a physical component. It is actions or behaviors that inflict physical injury or harms on individuals. So violence has a physical element. It, they, they, it is a behavior that is physical, uh, and a number of them uh, exist. For example, when we talk about violence, we are talk, talking about attack with weapons. It doesn't matter whether it's a gun, whether it's a machete, whether it's a stick or whatever. When you attack somebody with uh, you know, a weapon, I think the, in our law we call it sometimes we say dangerous weapons. I think every weapon is dangerous, I, you know, I think sociology. But lawyers have to, you know, the addressments, uh, don't look at me, Gaza. The, the lawyers have a way of speaking in tautology, you know, repeat the same word. Uh, so, 
uh, attack with weapons, it includes beating, it includes kicking, slapping, biting, rape, and other forms of sexual co coercion. So when we're talking about violence, we're talking about these physical activities. Many people will not attack their spouses with weapons, but also they probably don't beat, but probably kick occasionally, so it's slap not too much, beating or bite one another, or the weaker person bite the, the stronger one. So these are violence, when we talk about violence. What literature has shown, current knowledge shows, is that women are more likely to, to be victims of violence within the household than outside the household. I want you to underscore that. Women are more likely to be victims of violence in the household than outside the household. This is, uh, you know, literature that is fairly spread across the globe, whether developed or developing countries. What of men? Men are more likely to be victims of violence you know, in relationship with acquaintances and strangers. So most of the time that men are victims, they are likely to be outside of the home rather than within the home. While women, when they are victimized, they are likely to be home. And that brings some uh, you know, description that is often said in, uh, you know, in literature, in criminology literature, that the home, uh, the home ought to be sanctuary and haven, but often is a prison and a hell. Again, if you forget anything, this is one thing I want you to remember. The home is expected to be a sanctuary and a haven, but most often it's a prison and a hell. And the word prison there is very important. Prison is where you are and you have difficulty of escape. People who suffer domestic violence get trapped in their homes like the prisoners. They are not able to leave, and for different reasons. So, that's distinguishing between abuse and violence. If I'm exceeding 15 minutes, uh, Uncle Frank, come and push me away. What are the factors that influence domestic abuse and violent behaviors? Where do you think Boko Haram people learned their behavior? The bandits. They probably learn a lot of it from home. So let's start, we have what we call a social learning. And this we refer to as when a child grew up within an abusive or violent family. And we call that intergenerational transmission of violence. My father beat my mother, and I grew up to think it is appropriate to teach the woman a lesson each time the man is, ag is angry. Unfortunately, a lot of our culture sanctions that. Okay, thank you. A, a lot of our sanction, uh, control sanctions that. There is also a lot of societal and religious values of gender disparity that tend to encourage it. Women are weaker vessel, and the men are the stronger vessel, and therefore exercise your stronger vessility over the woman. Then, of course, there are other social factors. Alcohol abuse, drug abuse play a factor. Then low education, skills, and poverty also play a lot of factors. Financial distress, unemployment, and loss of employment. Loss of employment particularly has been found to be a major uh, you know, trigger of domestic violence. The man was working, suddenly lost his job. He no longer feels he's a man, and then the woman probably also is making demand. The man, of course, decides in the way to react out of frustration is to be the woman. But it's not acceptable. Why don't go out and beat another woman and see? Why is it the one in the home? Then, of course, when you have wide and educational discrepancy, when the woman and the man, man they have wide discrepancy in their education and income, especially to the, disadvantage, to the advantage of the woman, to the advantage of the woman, you are likely to have that. You have marriage customs and laws, and then you have weak legal, customary, and religious sanction. And people remain in abusive and violent relationship because they are economically dependent, they are encouraged by their family and friends and religious leaders, there is a fear of stigma, 
by society and religious organizations as well, as well as concern and welfare of the children. I've told my time is almost gone. Let me go quickly to the Nigerian legal system. We live, Christians live under the law. In the past, our law inadvertently support domestic violence unconsciously. In the North, for example, the penal code actually say that a man is entitled to discipline his wife. Yeah. So <laughs> what, what does that mean? He's entitled to discipline his wife. It was part of Northern Nigerian penal code. Fortunately or unfortunately, people always say in America, in America, when it comes to family relationship, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which side you are, America, America has come to Nigeria. In 2015, a law was passed, and the lawyers here will know, called Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. And then there are those ones in the state. About 22 states, as of last month, have uh, uh, domesticated the law. That means they apply in the state with almost similar provision. And Plateau State happens to be one. So again, when you are going to beat your wife or do any of, but beat your husband also, take cognizance of these uh, provisions. What are the provisions? I will just briefly have already been warned that my time is going. The first one is rape. Can there be rape within the household? Okay, I don't want to enter into the debate whether a, a, a husband can rape the wife or the wife can rape the husband. But we've heard of people, of men who rape their domestic worker who live within the house. So just to move on so that we don't have debate. Then, of course, if you do that, you have life imprisonment. And your, and your name, before you get to heaven, there is a register in which your name will be registered. That's the register you have. We don't go to, they call it sexual offenders register. So <laughs> that will be the first register you have. You will not go to heaven before you, you have that registered. So wherever you go and across the country, they be seen that X, again, is a sexual offender. Then, of course, if you inflict, another provision is if you inflict physical injury on another person, you have five years imprisonment. If you coerce another person to engage in any act to the detriment of that other person, and this is important, if you make somebody do something that is to the detriment of that person, physical or psychological well-being, three years. If you have compelled another person or forced them to engage in conduct, especially sexual conduct, to their detriment, again, is two years. If you, if you engage in female circumcision or genital mutilation, four years, those of you who say it's your culture, then forceful ejection from home. Oh, we have built a house. Now you can eject your wife or eject your husband. If you forcefully eject, that is two years. If you deprive your spouses or a member of the household of their liberty, you lock up the housemaid or even one of your children and lock them or deprive them of liberty. If you are convicted, again, you have two years. If you damage property, luckily, I think that is reducing. When I was growing up, a lot of women used to take their husband's uh, television and break it. <laughs> I, I, think, I think because women, <laughs> women watch uh, Z World and all those ones, I think they don't want to break the television. I don't know what they break now. <laughs> so, but if you do that, of course, that is two years. If you force the spouse or a member of the household to be financially dependent, of course, you have two years. It's regarded as economic abuse. You who say your wife should not work and you don't provide adequately for that person, that complaint may come under this. So again, I said you say America. America has come to Nigeria. Then, of course, forced isolation and separation from family and friends. One of the things that domestic abuse persons do is to make sure you don't have close relations with your friends and family anymore. They isolate you. So you, are, you, are, you are then become depressed until you become a vegetable in your house. Then, of course, emotion and viber psychological abuse and a range of behavior uh, belong to that. Then another is harmful widowhood practices. It's our culture to deprive these, 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 these. It belongs to uncle, it belongs to brothers. Of course, that is two years. Abandonment of children, three years. Stalking, that means following the person around two years. Intimidation is a year, and then spousal battery, now beating your wife to hell or beating your husband to hell. 
It's not, I grew up knowing a neighbor whose wife used to be the man. So it is not, before I studied criminology, I knew that does happen. It's just rare, but it does happen. And uh, the, I think the agreement they have is that they lock the door when that is happening. They lock the door, but we all, <laughs> even as children growing, when the man comes out and uh, sits in his cell, you know, easy chair in a particular way, we knew he has had discipline that day. <laughs> and then the law talks about harmful traditional practice. The offense created, I will be done in another two minutes, three minutes. Of the offense created four level of offenses and it's important. And the last two I'm particularly worried for the church. The one is committing the offense. The one is attempting to commit the offense. They all have their different uh, sentences. But the third one talks about incites, aids, abets, or counsels. Madam in-laws, uncle in-laws, you are in trouble here. You are in trouble here. Incites, aids, abets, or counsels, offender. They call it, is it a better in law? And the final group is receives or assist offender. This is where I'm afraid for the church. Receives, receive or assist the offender. If you know that a woman had been beaten and you receive him or her, or, you know, a woman, her, and you did not report appropriately, you have received and you have assisted and the accessory after the crime. And you also libel for certain things. I'm really afraid. And I think that's where we should have more, deep, you know, for counselors and the rest of them, uh, if we're serious uh, Christian groups in Nigeria and church, the churches, this is the kind of thing that I think leadership of the denominations should say, how do we respond to this? And then we have some standard operating procedures in dealing with this kind of matter to avoid it. So these offenses, uh, the, what I read out, luckily for you, is uh, maximum terms of imprisonment. There is fine as an option, you could pay a fine, or the judge might give you both. That's, you know, imprisonment and fine. There's provision for compensation. I'll just say another important one that is important. The law also allows for protection order, and this is a very powerful element of that law. What does that mean? It means the complainer, that the person who is a victim, who complained to the judge, uh, received a protection order to be protected against the respondent. The case has not even been heard. It's not yet heard. Just on the basis of the complaint, the judge determines a prima facie case exists, and then he, can, he or she can issue the following order. He can, come, you know, he can issue a prohibition that that individual should not commit any act of domestic violence. It does not even limit it, just it's brought any domestic violence or enlisting the help of another person to commit any such act. Entering a shared household, provided that the court may impose this prohibition only if it appears to be in the best interest of the complainant. So immediately that happens, you may be asked not to enter the house you live together. Then, of course, entering a specified part of such a shared house, they may ask you not to go into the kitchen, if it's that where you find the knife. And then, of course, Enter the complainant's residence. If it's living, already living alone, you can't enter the, you know, the residence. Of course, you cannot go to the place of employment. You know some people go to embarrass the victim. Yes, just 30 seconds. Just 30 seconds. Uh, I think you've actually tried. So, um, you, know, you can't go to the place of employment. It's also preventing, it cannot prevent the complainant from entering any particular place. It's cannot alienate or dispose property that belong to them jointly, renouncing his or rights in a shared household. Uh, you know, these are the things that may order that may be, uh, or, you know, given by a court even before the case is had. I just pray that we be protected uh, in the things we took for granted before, that we will not end up in jail. But if you do, please call me. I have any friends there. Thank you very much, Professor. That was a wonderful analysis. I thought he was even a lawyer speaking in court this morning. Yes, we're going to call on Professor Amaka Otikos on the second section this morning. Good morning, people of God. Please, ICT, project the things because there's so much to talk about and I don't want to spend too much time before Lydia will drive me, Lydia will drive me away from here. 
Okay, um, from what Uncle has said, as he said, America has come to Nigeria. The laws have come. Implementation will soon start. So, everybody, wear your regard very well and be ready. So, make sure you are not found on the wrong side of the law. Hallelujah. All right. So, also to remind all of us that the people in, or who are victims of domestic violence, as Uncle has said, just to remind us, include your house helps, the people who live with you, your relatives, your children, because some, I know somebody whose child came to report or talk to her about somebody trying to um, get her involved in lesbian activities. And what the mother did was to grind pepper and put it in her genitals in the 20th century. It happened here in Jos. So people abuse their children, abuse parents, as Uncle has reminded us, especially when they are old and they are sick. Abuse spouses, that is the one that is all over the news that we hear. Siblings also abuse each other in the name of fighting. You, you, you go overboard and do things you are not supposed to do to your siblings. So let's remember that when we are talking about domestic, um, domestic violence and domestic abuse. It's not showing on the screen. I don't want to be seeing myself. I want the people to see what is going on um, there. Okay, these are all the things Uncle has talked about. Um, we will try to put the, the slides on the church um, different platforms so that people could look at them um, later. Sorry, I'm trying to get to where I'm supposed to start talking. So I'm supposed to be talking about the effects of domestic violence. Now, we know that the effects are physical because you could do physical harm. You injure people, you break their hands, you break their heads. Some people become unconscious. Some people even die, you know, from the injuries sustained during the violent act. Some people also develop mental and psychological issues, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, depression, suicidal tendencies, and some people even outrightly um, carry out the suicide act itself. Um, but we will say the person died in his sleep, right? I will not remember that these are some of the things that um, have accrued or have happened because um, somebody has been depressed because of domestic violence. Increased um, uh, features of other medical uh, conditions, including things like peptic ulcer, gets worse with domestic violence. Uh, mentally also, people have low self-esteem. Mental illness, as I said earlier, also becomes... Um, um, begins to manifest, or if it was there previously, even becomes worse. Then the effect can also be spiritual. You know, we just look at it as physical, but some people, uh, because of what they have gone through, it also affects their relationship with God. You're asking, God, why me? God, I'm disappointed in you. God, I'm not talking to you anymore. God, I'm not praying anymore. Some people even begin to have crisis of faith, and some people even decide not to follow Jesus anymore because the person who has been abusing or has been abusive many times is somebody sometimes highly regarded in church, very respectable. And even if the person tells the story that this is what this person is doing to me, nobody will believe the person because this person is spiritual, you know, highly anointed, but is abusing the person at home. So, then others, children, remember, children, when they, even if they are not the ones being abused, their spousal abuse um, at home, it affects children psychologically, and they have issues even as they grow up, and even being able to form proper bonds and relationships as they get older. Siblings, you know, you have sibling problems, especially when you're abusing parents. Siblings begin to quarrel. You beat mama, you push mama, you broke mama's hand. We start not talking to each other and all that. It causes problems. Of course, in-laws, I don't need to go into all that. You know that. Then family feuds. This family and this family, our children have had problems. They've quarreled. So family A and family B, they were in-laws before who were, you know, like they loved each other and they were relating with each other. But once the family problems start, these in-laws are quarreling. And sometimes it extends to the extended family and, you know, we are not talking to each other again because of what has happened between our children. And, of course, it, it, once the family has problems, it rolls over into the society. Once you have family problems, there are always societal problems associated. So what do we do? Now we need to have the correct worldview based on, on what Uncle has said. God has created us in families. He's put us in families. And families are supposed to be a safe place. 
a place where we are well protected. And the family is meant to honor God and to benefit each other. That's what families are supposed to be. We're supposed to encourage one another. And you see the scriptures we have put down there. You go home and look at those scriptures very well. Husbands loving wives, wives submitting to husbands, wife loving husbands, and what love really is. Love is not words. Love is action. Love is action. It is kind. It, you know, it does not rejoice in evil. It does not do the other person harm. And God has called us even to love and do good to even our enemies. You heard the words we read from Romans 12 today. Even our enemies were supposed to do them good. How much more the people who live with us? Then, um, as I said, the family is supposed to be a safe place. It's supposed to be a place of support, a place of encouragement. And as Uncle has said, now many families have become a hell and a prison instead of being a heaven and a place of succor for us. And we need to remind ourselves that family life is one of the major testimonies to the world of the difference that Jesus makes in lives. It is a major um, area that you see differences between believers and unbelievers, the way people should do things. Unfortunately, many Christian families sometimes even seem to be worse than what the world is doing, the way we treat one another. Now, how do we prevent um, domestic violence? Well, we do what we can do. First of all, we try and pro uh, provide stable homes for our children so that they can grow and develop normally and be normal, well-adjusted individuals um, who can thrive well in society and form good and proper relationships with other people even as they grow older. Then we need to train our children on how to treat other people. Some of us allow our children to be so nasty and badly behaved. And then when they now grow up as terrible people in society, we are now looking for a girl who will become the rehabilitation center for your badly brought up son or a boy who will become rehabilitation for your badly brought up daughter. Parents, 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 raise your children right. Um, when um, Neka was praying, she, she prayed and one of the things was the issue, that the, um, the issue that raising children is a big job. It's not easy to train children. It takes a lot from you. But these children didn't ask you to have them. You decided to have them. So the honors lies on you to raise them right. Because we all give account of how we raised our children. Then, for young people, I will at this point also ask you, please avoid unequal yoke. A good marriage and a Christ-honoring marriage is not based on, on six-pack. It's not based on um, figure eight. It's not based on baby face and very beautiful girl. Do you understand? It is based on, a, on if you're a person who fears the Lord, marry somebody who fears the Lord. I said fears the Lord. I didn't say comes to church. Because some people come to church and they have no fear for Jesus. They do not tremble at his word and they are not ready to obey the word of God. So once you see somebody who is not walking that line with you, please just leave the person and walk away. You are not the Holy Spirit that convicts men of righteousness, judgment, and sin. It's not your job to, come, to change anybody to become a Christian. If he's not a Christian, walk away. Walk away. Your heart may be broken, but it will be broken because you went into a relationship you shouldn't have gone into. But every broken heart can be healed. Right? Better to obey the Lord. He will heal your heart and move forward. Don't say you were not warned. Then walk away from every sign of abuse. You are in a relationship, they are telling you, I will slap you. Eh? I will slap you. Don't wait to be slapped. If anybody wants, walk away. If you are in a relationship where the person has no respect for you, you are talking, he or she says, shut up. Shut up. Who are you? My dear, walk away. Don't even have conversation. Just walk away. They slap you. Both girls and boys, I know people who slap. They slap you and they will come and beg you. You see that one? Forgive them in your heart, but don't return to the relationship. Yes. In this one, there's no forgiveness and come back. Don't listen to aunties, uncles, and friends who come to reconcile you. Say, let bygones be bygones. He will change. God, in his mercy, has already shown you warning of a violent man or woman. Run for your life. If you like, stay there. Then when it happens, you come to church and start telling us to pray and encourage you encourage you. Many people who have had violent partners, at least from my experience and people I have talked to and counseled, the violence started 
before they got married. And there was room to run away. But because you are ashamed, you are embarrassed, or you don't want people to talk about, let them talk. Your life and your safety is more important than what people have to say. So please, walk away. And then let us determine in our hearts to walk in the spirit, not to give in to the lust of the flesh. Let's learn to walk as, and grow as Christians. You have been a Christian for 20 years. You are still the same. When they talk to you, you say you have anger problem. What is anger problem? Is that the fruit of the spirit? Thank you. So we need to grow and become more and more like Jesus with every passing day. So don't say, eh, she annoyed me. Response to frustration is a choice. Is a choice. And God has called us to make proper choices. So learn to walk in the spirit. Expose yourself continually to the Lord. In the place of prayer, in the place of study of his word. And make up your mind to obey the word of God. To every little dot. And the Lord will help you. Then deal with anger and violence issues. As I said, don't say you have anger problem. It runs in your family. What's the meaning of that? Going to hell does it not run in families of men. Have you not come out from it and accepted Jesus? You want to go to heaven. So if you want to go to heaven, also break away family cause of anger, of violence, and all that. Because you have broken away from the head, uh, heading to hell. So please, deal with anger. If you cannot do it on your own, seek help. There is help. There is help. You must learn to deal with anger. Drugs and alcohol, they've talked about alcohol and, and um, drug dependence in this church severally. Let's avoid it. If you're already in it, you don't know what to do, there is help. Come look for help. They will help you or we will help you solve this problem. Because some of this, as Uncle had said, are the things that predispose people to be violent in their homes. Then develop your communication and conflict resolution skills. Young people, this is the time to do it. It's not when you marry you will start. Now, learn to communicate. Learn to talk. You annoyed me. You upset me. I don't like what you did. I don't like what you... Then let the person talk back. And you talk about... It's not once you're angry, you slap. Once you're angry, you do this. You do violent things. That will not help. And it will cause more trouble for all of us. So, are you a victim of domestic violence? I didn't say you should answer. Just remember, <laughs> if you are, God loves you and is interested in your problem. Do you understand? God loves you. I know that this... Um, domestic violence and abuse issues are things that people don't want to talk about in church. But we have to talk, we must have those difficult conversations. They must be had. We can't be sweep them under the carpet because they are real and they are happening around us. So if you have, if you are experiencing domestic violence, domestic abuse, please, God loves you and is interested in your matter. Do not keep quiet. Speak up. I know that during premarital counseling, we tell you, you know, your problems are between you and your husband. But you see this type of problem. It's not between you and your spouse. It's not between you and your wife. When domestic violence is time to shout out, not only speak out, shout out, look for help. Don't keep quiet and die in, the, in that prison of silence. Speak out. Do not keep quiet. Speak out. Look for somebody to talk to. There are people to talk to. We have uh, family life committee members. We have pastors here who will talk to you, who will encourage you, who will help you to do what you need to do. You can't wish it away. It will not go away. It is there and it needs to be solved. Help is available. There's counseling, medical, psychological support available for you. There's room for healing of heart wounds. And we have to think of the issues of safety. Don't stay there and die. How do we help victims? You know people who have this problem. Please encourage them. Don't give up on them. Because sometimes family members also give up on their family members who are being abused. She said, if she likes, let her stay there and die. We've talked to her. She doesn't want to come out. It is not easy. Uncle he said, he had said, it is a prison. And sometimes for various reasons, it is difficult for people to walk away from it. So please don't give up on that, your sister. Don't give up on that, your brother. Keep praying. Keep being available for them. One day, sometime, they will be able to arise and take action. But please, don't walk away and give up on them. Continue to pray for them and provide, be available to be a support system for them. Um, okay. Hmm. Then, um, um, signs, sometimes you have, um, sometimes we have people who don't want to speak up, no matter what you do. It's a tough call. It's a delicate matter, but we will not give up. We will keep at it, we will keep praying, we will keep encouraging until they are willing to speak out and get help. 
Now, sometimes you have people around you who are being abused, but um, you can identify them. You can identify them sometimes. Their behavior changes. Okay. Their behavior changes, but physical signs. Somebody always has one black eye, the other black eye, one leg is broken, the other one, she's bending down to work. What is the problem? Uh, I think it's typhoid. I think it's malaria. What happened to your eye? I fell down the stairs. I hit my leg on the door. Over and over again, my brother, my sister, that your sister or brother is being abused. And you need to look and check, uh, check it very well. Then emotional signs. Some become withdrawn. Somebody, maybe somebody who is noisy like me, suddenly becomes quiet. Does not talk. You know? Association of noisemakers. Are we here? Yeah. I know, yeah, we are here. So suddenly we become quiet. We don't talk. We don't make noise anymore. We sit in one corner. They're asking us questions. Even to answer is difficult. That person is undergoing abuse. Then change in behavior, as I said. You know, they become overly anxious, worried, jittery. You see fear all over them. They become paralyzed to do anything. That is a sign or a likelihood that that person is being abused and you need to intervene or at least ask more questions so that you can offer help to the person or direct them to where they can get help. How do we help abusers? Yes, they are abusers, but some of them are still our brethren. Have we driven them away? Okay, so if you know somebody like that, you need to start talking to the person. Some people have problems and they need help. So you need, may need to direct them to where they can get help. You know, don't keep quiet and say, my brother has demonic issues. I know somebody who is being abused, and I asked her, I said, what did your husband's relatives say? He said that the sister said, my brother has spiritual problem. So they know he has a problem, and so they are praying. Meanwhile, you are almost killing somebody's daughter. So it's not just spiritual problem. Some physical things need to be done. You know, and then deal with the different issues, whether drug, whether alcohol. We can't just ignore them and walk away. And then, I don't know, maybe when we come to church discipline, maybe church pastors, maybe we shouldn't just stop at only disciplining people for fornication and adultery. This is an area where maybe we should consider giving people discipline. Yes. When they give you back seat and say he beats his wife or she bites her husband, then uh, maybe some people will change. So EPC, EPC, how are we doing concerning abuse, domestic abuse, domestic violence? Are we doing well? Are we doing well? Anyway, let's ask ourselves. So <laughs> I would just encourage us while we think about it, that let our homes be light and hope to our hurting world. And that means from the people in the home, they must have joy, they must be well taken care of, so that as people are looking at us from outside, they know that Jesus lives in this house. Alright? Let us make our homes safe for everyone. Children, house helps, everybody. The home should be a place of safety. Let us prevent harm and truly be like Jesus. And the question we must always ask ourselves in every situation, whether they annoyed you, whether they frustrated you, what will your master Jesus do? God bless you. Thank you very much, Professor Amaka, for that wonderful presentation this morning. Um, the professor said that um, the penal code of the north in the northern states give allowance for, five particularly give allowance for men to beat their wife or discipline them. But well, thank God for Plateau State. That aspect of the law has been abolished in the new penal code of Plateau State. So put it behind your mind, men, you can't do that in Plateau State. So also our, yes, men and women too, but it's for men. You can't do that in Plateau State. And so the, the VAP Act has also helped us in Plateau State. It is said that you, as a parent, should be able to train your children don't make, don't pick a girl or a, a, a man to be a rehabilitation center for your child. Your work from the beginning of when the child is in the stomach to when he grows up, it's your responsibility to train the child to be an ambassador, a good, underlying good ambassador in the society. We're still waiting for questions. Seems number of you want to ask questions this morning on this burning topical issue. And also, please. Amaka said something. 
please walk away. Walk away. I've been working in a society or in a place where every day we get cases of abuses. Every day. Violence, sexual abuses, father abusing the, the children. Please walk away. We'll give three, three minutes each to the speakers around if we don't have questions. If there's something you want to add, they add and then we'll close. Professor Alemikas. Okay, questions are coming in. Thank you. I thought we are just very good, no questions. And that would have been wonderful this morning. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> to our speakers. We have um, three questions coming in this morning. Number one question. If a wife continually continuously deprives her husband of sex to the extent he is asking for permission from her to get it outside. What counsel do we have for that couple? Is deprivation of marital rights abuse? Uh, what, on that one please, what do you do when you are already married and your spouse doesn't, doesn't respect you? <laughs> Um, number three, what do you do when your spouse say things that causes emotional depression to you, even after several discussions to resolve or explain issues? Uh, we have another one here, already in it. He said, what do you do when you are already in it? The man I married pretended to be good, but I immediately, immediately after marriage, or after we are married, it changed. It changed. He doesn't want to hear God's word, but I gather my children and pray and share God's word with them. He beats me always. Another one says, there are instances where the old parent also abuses their daughter, daughter-in-law. Though not very common, but it happens. The man ganged up with his mother and... You don't see anything good about the daughter-in-law. What do one do? Thank you. Over to you, professors. Thank you. My position is simply there are decisions you have to take on your own. And uh, you won't get affirmation from people. You have to decide by yourself, how much can I take? How much can I take? You have to answer that question. You won't get the result from me because we have different capability to endure, different capability to uh, relate to certain issues. Let me just say we have dealt with more of violence. And that, maybe that's why some of these questions are coming. When we talk about abuse and part of it, uh, which is covered by, you know, is also, is what we call denial of entitlement. And those entitlements may be food, it may be shelter, it may be sex, it may be recreation time. Even for children or housemaid, you deny them recreation time. You expect them to walk all night until you are asleep, they cannot sleep. Of course, you prevent them from seeking access to certain, to education, to skill acquisition, to trading. There are many things that are included in all these. It's, they are generally bunched together as deniers of entitlement that you know, enhances, entitlement that enhances uh, well-being. So the specific question also, part of this is also belittling. If you are constantly belittled by your spouse, you are not likely to have mental well-being. And it comes in different ways. Uh, the husband always say, oh, because like the children, you are stupid. Or the wife always say, you are not equal to your mate. It is only house. You come to do man. But outside, you are not. You know, there are all these belittling words that we take. They're also included in this. It's not just the physical beating, but all this. They are actually cause, sometimes we call them pathway. Those are actually sometimes pathways to the violence that we encounter. So we need to also you know, take uh, 
uh, some measure about that. You see, when you talk about relationship that is abusive in the way that I've described it, there is some insecurity on the part of the abusing uh, person. And that insecurity is where the counseling should be targeted. Why is that person insecure about his wife? Why is he insecure about his husband? It might be a spiritual issue, but very often it's a social, it's a cultural, it's a child-rearing uh, problem that the person has. And as Auntie Amaka said, when you say you have uh, trained to be angry, the question we ask, and it's, it's, a, it's a cliche in criminology, if you have anger problem, why is it that you don't go to the street and be beating women? Why is it your anger only in the house? Why does he manage? It's when you step into the house that your anger problem emerge. Why not in other places? So I don't think there are excuses for many of these issues. And then the man backslided. I think there is a Pauline cancel. But I leave you with this word. And this is what I think we should ask God about marriage. I think there is undue emphasis on marriage beyond that is intended. If you read the Bible very well, I'm not a theologian. Marriage is actually an act of weakness rather than strength, according to Paul. He said, if you are not able to, then marry. Hmm? So, if you know you have an anger problem, maybe you shouldn't marry. No, I, I'm just, you know, maybe you, until you can deal with that anger problem, maybe you shouldn't marry. And I, I think there are certain behavior that maturity is also, uh, young people, many people are being driven to marry when they are not yet mature to bear the burden of marriage. I know the women fellowship, they tell you, sing, Aurena, the daddy, Mm -hmm. Until you get inside, whether that daddy or not, or something else. So, be, be sure that it is only the daddy you will pick, or you will enjoy when you get in, and not the other side. So, you ask difficult questions. Those questions are best asked by, look for somebody you respect, and you know he has capacity for counseling. We can't adequately answer those questions on this uh, pulpit. Thank you. Strong things happening in the house of God. The Lord will help all of us. Somebody is asking, you are in a family that is mixed with Muslims. They don't involve you in their marriages, burials, and other family issues. How do you respond to them as a Christian? This one is an, a full day's preaching and topic. But you'll be light. You will shine at light. You will love them. But if somebody doesn't invite you to their event, why do you want to invite yourself? Is it by force? It will save you money from our shape. It will save you many things. You will have more time to rest. So don't feel pained. Rejoice and rest. But love them. Encourage them. When they come to your house, greet them very well. So if they tell you about the wedding, say, how did the wedding go? If they don't tell you about the wedding, mind your business. Is that one hard? Uh -huh. if, they don't, if they don't involve you, don't involve yourself. But continue to love them. Do good to them. Do what you can to help who needs help. But don't, if they don't want you, don't you force yourself. It's not by force. Um, encouraging those who don't want to report. Um, on the screen, media, please put the screen. Let everybody see. Leah's number is there. You can help report for somebody who is being abused. In other words, if you notice your neighbor is being abused, she's not speaking up, you can report. Okay? That's the number. So, out in love, report. Don't wait until they invite you for the burial. Then they'll say, neighbors, come and give testimony about her. She was a nice Christian woman. Nye, 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 nye. But you saw her being killed and you kept quiet. Where is the love of Christ in you? So that's the number. If you know your neighbor is being abused, your sister is being abused, she doesn't want to talk about it, please call the number and they will know what to do. Um, training up a child, discipline is expected. What is... What becomes abuse in the training of a child? If you are disciplining a child, discipline is supposed to be for correction, not to injure anybody, not to wound anybody, not to emotionally scar anybody. 
So one of, the, one of the things first you need to learn is that you never discipline children in anger. Is it easy to do? No. I'm a parent. Many times I'm angry. I want to act immediately. But I've realized that you need to calm down. Think it through. Make it, plan what you need to do concerning that matter and institute the discipline. But you see, discipline, we must institute. And it comes in different ways. It's not only when you flog a child, you have disciplined a child. There are various ways to discipline a child. And under God, he will show you what to do. But you must arrange your mind. Because it's difficult to discipline a child that you love. For mothers, the one we carry for six months. Abba, it's, very, it's not easy to discipline them. You don't want them to cry. You don't want them to feel pain. You don't want to deny them any pleasure in life. But if you want your children to turn out well, you have to do it. You see this heart, you go stronger. If they need to do it under God and um, just arrange yourself. If you need to cry, go and cry in the toilet. But don't cry in front of them so that they will not think that uh, you are playing. All right? So you need to discipline and do what needs to be done. God bless us all. We give thanks to the Lord for the opportunity to talk on this very touchy but important issue. And we do thank the two of you for sharing this with us. I know it's just a tip of the iceberg. And like uh, Etanibi said, it's not something that we can finish here this morning. But please, the, the Family Life Committee, the pastors, uh, the elders, and other people within the church are available for you to cry on their shoulders and uh, share these concerns so that you can find help. Please don't die in silence. Talk about it. Find somebody reliable who can help you come out of an abusive relationship. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for all that you have spoken to us. Thank you for what you have taught us and knew. Thank you for what you have reminded us on. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives in us, uh, who leads us and guides us into all truth. And thank you for the church that is available uh, to us to find help in times of need. And ask, dear Lord, that if there are any who are going through any of such violence or abuse this morning, that, Lord, you will reach out to them. Father, please give them help. We ask that you dismiss us now with your blessings as we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name.